Good evening. We've heard the new president address the nation on two important occasions in the last four weeks. And we've heard or read many comments praising him. Coherent English sentences, good ideas, no threats to kill, and even starting on time and not overstaying his welcome. In other words, not speaking like President Rodrigo Duterte. But how is President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. in himself as a public speaker? Are his speeches as written and as delivered really as good as comments say they are? Let's talk. I'm John Neri and you are in the public square. President Marcos's inaugural address on June 30 sought to strike an elevated tone. His first State of the Nation address on July 25, two days ago, was much more technical, even technocratic. But even some of his election rivals' ardent supporters called the speeches good. Are they? And he, is he, in fact, an effective public speaker? We are joined tonight by Dr. Oscar O.J. Serkinia Jr., Assistant Professor of Speech Communication at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. He is a newly minted PhD in theater studies from the University of Melbourne. And his Twitter thread on Monday was a must-read live commentary on the State of the Nation address. Good evening, Professor Serkinia. Thank you for joining us today in the public square. Hello, John. Good evening to you and to our viewers. Thank you for inviting me to your show. I'm happy Thanks. to be here. Thank you. First things first, uh, how do you analyze a public speech? Uh, what perspective do you use? Is it uh, political theater? Is it the art of rhetoric? When I look at a speech or analyze a speech, John, I look at it from the point of view of both rhetoric and performance. Okay. So a public speech to me is a rhetorical performance. So let me parse that for you and for our viewers. So when we say rhetoric, we are dealing with um, the systematic study and intentional practice of effective symbolic expression. So there is a process by which we analyze arguments, appeals, um, what else, the arrangement of a speech, and of okay. course the aesthetic the aesthetic um, regime of that speech. Mm -hmm. So we look into the assertions, the, the strategies, the ordering of a message, and the elements of form, beauty, and force uh, that are inherent to or in a symbolic expression such as a public speech. When we say performance, it is an embodied act. It is something that is done and carried out by someone before an audience mm -hmm. in a particular occasion or event to achieve a particular purpose. So as a professor and as a scholar of both rhetoric and performance studies, mm -hmm. this is how I view a public speech. It is a rhetorical performance. Would you say that is the way uh, most other people would also judge a speech? Although, of course, not necessarily uh, using the same terms or uh, having the same theoretical framework. They see, on the one hand, it's a... Uh, selection of words uh, purposely put together and then on the other hand it's also someone uh, giving life to these words it, would, would, would that be uh, the right way of putting it? Well to a certain extent um, rhetoric and performance studies intersect with other disciplines such as political science, sociology mm -hmm. mass communication but I would like to argue that rhetoric and performance pay extreme and careful attention to how a speech is planned, how it's adapted to an audience, how it is shaped by human motives, how it responds to a situation, and how ultimately it aims to achieve persuasion. Okay. So a rhetorical perspective is always um, interested in persuasion. Okay. How does a speaker 
move right an audience and move them in a way that would help him achieve or her achieve a particular goal or objective or an outcome okay let's go to specifics uh the okay. inaugural address of june 30 you described it as being in the high oratorical style what does it mean right i mean i look at the speech delivered on june 30 as oratorical poetic even highly stylized and idiomatic because one of its content right and number two because of its delivery so in terms of content i noticed a lot of flourishes mm -hmm. abstractions lofty ideas even nostalgic takes um dreamy right dreamy formulations and mm -hmm. even forward looking promises no mm -hmm. it is oratorical because of its delivery on the other hand when i say delivery um it is very measured it's very constrained schooled i would say mm -hmm. unlike of course unlike as we all know um the speech style of marcus jr's predecessor Mm -hmm. So, and ultimately, it is oratorical because it follows it follows the communicative protocols, right? That the rhetorical tradition has been subscribing to for the longest time. I, I actually uh, thought that the inaugural address of uh, the Sun uh, was very different from the three inaugural addresses of mm -hmm. the Father. So okay. in preparation for covering the inauguration, I reread um, the inaugural address of Ferdinand Marcos, uh, uh, the dictator, uh, in 1965, 1969, and 1981. What struck me was that it was very sweeping. Uh, he mm -hmm. talks of uh, the destiny of the nation as a great nation. Literally, he says this nation in 1965. He talks about revolution. He talks about transforming the state. And of course, in 1981, he actually inaugurated a new republic. Um, on the other hand, Ferdinand Marcos Jr.'s inaugural address, June 30, 2022, I found rather unambitious. Mm -hmm. um, number one, do you... Do you uh, uh, agree with this uh, uh, um, critique? And number two, is it possibly a case in uh, the difference in audiences? In the 1960s, all, all the way up to 1981, uh, Marcos had this idea of addressing this particular kind of audience. Uh, and now in the 20 sec 21st century, in 2022, uh, maybe people don't respond to uh hmm. formulations of greatness you know revolutionary mm -hmm. transformations and so on right what do you think? right um i would like to offer a different take no um mm -hmm. john i mm -hmm. i think marcus jr is deriving a lot of strategies that his father used right mm -hmm. um like his father marcus jr avoids sounding pedestrian mm -hmm. he tries his best to sound eloquent and intelligent, right? And unlike what you said, that he is deviating from his father's strategies, such as mouthing terms such as revolution, etc. Mm -hmm. I, I think he is um, regurgitating or reiterating some of these strategies, albeit in different ways albeit in different ways. I think like his dad, like his dad, Marcus Jr., especially in his inaugural speech, was also mythical in register. So what do I mean by this? Mm -hmm. If you listen to his speech, you'd sense there an attention to what a nation should be, what the Filipino race should be, what the Filipino people should be, right? Mm -hmm. And in a sense, this is a mythical formulation because you are prescribing an abstract idea of a particular entity. Furthermore, he talked about the faith in the Filipino, right? 
there's even a statement there where he said, believe, have hope. The sun also rises as it did today, as it did to, uh, yesterday, as it will tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think these statements, these phrases are mythical in, in many ways, right? Because they're, they're hard to pin down, that's one. And number two, they're meant to create a larger-than-life image of the nation, the race, and the people. And I think that strategy is not new. It's something that Marcos is um, borrowing from his father. Yeah, I, I agree that uh, he did uh, borrow, appropriate uh, the strategies of his father uh, as well as of other uh, public speakers. Uh, I think my point was uh, really uh, having to do with the theme. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. He was also offering us a myth. Uh, this is a myth that mm -hmm. has been uh, put together over the last several years, especially on their alternative in, uh, information infrastructure on social media. Um, so there's a lot of uh, what the Americans would call uh, dog uh, whistles here. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, they 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 they. they they read one way and they sound uh, another mm -hmm. way for, for mm -hmm. a different audience. I guess my point here was that maybe the myths that he is pro professing are smaller myths. <laughs> um, yeah. For instance, Marcos in 1969, uh, the father in 1969, called on Filipinos to be heroes. Uh, mm -hmm. In 2022, the son, Marcos the son, uh, tells Filipinos, okay, you know, you, you, need, you do what you need to do and we will be there with you. Uh, yes. So there's that, uh, that yeah. difference in uh, uh, thematic appeal. Maybe. But but in a way, John, the myth now is about the son, right? When that's he said, right. "Ang pangarap niyo ay pangarap ko," that's about him, right? right. When he said, um, I, "I I I garnered the biggest electoral mandate in Philippine history," right? That's a myth about him. When he said, I am ready for the task, I will get it done. That's, again, myth-making about himself. So I think this, this strategy speaks so much about the need to emphasize his legitimacy and authority mm -hmm. as a leader. That's right. Excellent point. Thank you, uh, Professor OJ. Let's go to the first State of the Nation address, uh, which ran for a little over an hour, an hour and 18 minutes, I think. And uh, you wrote a 12 uh, tweet uh, thread, uh, I found very uh, provocative, uh, also very perceptive. Uh, in, in the end, uh, you had many things to say, but in the end, you called it a clear and clean speech. Can yeah. you explain that? Well, when I was listening to him, I thought it was hitting the right spots mm -hmm. in that it provided clear outline of what the president want, would want to do or will do in the following years or in the next year, right? And I think my appreciation of that stems not only from the fact that his predecessor wasn't like that, mm -hmm. but also from the fact that Marcus Jr. during the campaign wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. So my, let's say, appreciation of mm -hmm. that particular speech as clear and clean mm -hmm. is set against not only what Duterte was not, but also what Marcos was not during the campaign. That's right. So I think, mm -hmm. I think it, was, it was a total departure from what he was during that particular campaign period. So it, it was kind of refreshing to finally hear Marcus Jr. showing to us that, hey, this guy has a plan. We may disagree or agree with this plan, but mm -hmm. okay, he, he has, I think even, uh, they called it a 19-point agenda, right? Yeah. Whether this 19-point agenda is achievable or not in the next six years, that's a different matter altogether. But as a speech, as a rhetorical performance, Mm -hmm. it, 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 it gave me specifics. I thought that uh, the sauna, the first sauna, was a speech in parts. <clears throat> By that, I mean that as a writer, I thought I could see 
some of the scenes uh, they were showing. Mm. Uh, for instance, uh, the, later in the speech, there was uh, the reintroduction of the pandemic as though it had not yet been uh, mentioned before. Um, did you get that sense also that uh, I, I think you talked about uh, a sectoral approach and you, and you yes. welcomed it? Uh, did you get that sense also, like, for instance, the first, I don't know what, 15, 20 minutes, very technical, right? Very technocratic, right. very numbers-based. And I thought that was very different from the rest of the speech. Right. Do you agree? I mean, in, in all honesty, the speech was a bit straightforward mm -hmm. and unexciting mm -hmm. in that it just enumerated what the president would want to do in the next years. Right. This, to me, um, indicated that he listened very well to his advisors and that he took into consideration what they had to say about, mm -hmm. about key issues of the nation. But also, I mean, that's the nature of a sauna. It's really providing a checklist of what to expect from the president. So to that extent, I think it was... It achieved it achieved um, the, the the basic requirements of a sauna, right? So so um, it 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 was able to present to us what to demand from this president in the next years. And but what is more interesting to me, John, is that mm -hmm. in this speech, which I consider as very different from the inaugural speech, in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It did not have the mythical, poetic, idiomatic mm -hmm. um, register mm -hmm. of the the former speech, right? This this one is is a bit, as you said, technocratic, mm -hmm. right? It's technocratic. It's very measured and rehearsed, right? It's very direct to the point, and it appealed a lot to reason. Right, it had data, it had facts, it had statistics. So, in a way, very different from um, what Duterte delivered during his time. In a way, this speech can be aligned with or compared with the speeches of, say, former President Gloria Macapagal-Arroyo. Mm -hmm. Right? It's it's very it's it's very um, technocratic in a way that this is what my government will do or this is what I plan to do or this is what I have started doing, etc. I, I want to go back to this point uh, and actually dwell on this uh, point about the role of uh, the State of the Nation address, you know, uh, going all the way back to the American tradition which we inherited. Uh, but uh, you said something in your uh, analysis now that... Uh, I thought, well, I would like you to define it uh, first. Uh, actually, going through your Twitter thread, there are a couple, there are maybe three terms I'd like you to to define first. No, uh, wh what does register mean? When you say uh, it, it was technocratic in register, what does that mean? When I when I use the term register, I am thinking mm -hmm. of how a speaker or even a rhetorical performer keys his his or her audience into a particular issue, mm -hmm. right? So in this sense, when I say technocratic register, I'm actually talking about how Marcos Jr. would like us to appreciate him depending on the rationalization or the rational perspective to governance, for example. Right, governance to him is empirical. It's uh, rational, measured, calculated, as evidenced or as marked, right? By especially in the first part of his speech, the references to facts, to statistics, to figures, etc. Right. So, or I'm, yeah, I'm I'm not a very there musical is. person, but uh, would would that mean that register is something like key? In music, it's yes. like yes, yes. That's that's how I understand it. In mm -hmm. performance studies, it is how a performer, an actor, or a speaker tries to situate a particular discourse, right, okay. to his audience. Yeah. All right. 
two two more terms for definition, if you don't mind. Uh, orthodox. When you say uh, this this speech was orthodox or in the orthodox style, what does that right. mean? When I say orthodox, it is really traditional. It follows what I call communicative protocols. It okay. has a clear um, introduction, mm -hmm. middle, and end. Okay. Very mm -hmm. different from what my, my colleagues have called the epic style, right? The epic style okay. of mm -hmm. Rodrigo Duterte. As we all know, Rodrigo Duterte is open-ended or protracted, right? Mm -hmm. you, you don't know where he'd stop or where he'd um, begin. This time, in contrast to Duterte's epic mode, I noticed an episodic mode, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, with, with Marcos. When I say episodic, as I said, there's a clear beginning, mm -hmm. middle, mm -hmm. and end. Mm -hmm. There is a sectoral approach. So I start with um, the economy, then I move with agriculture, and mm -hmm. then um, social work, mm -hmm. uh, education, etc. So right. it was easy to follow, and the rhetorical strategies are in place. They're mm -hmm. in place. Mm -hmm. He was he was um, um, not off script, but he was actually scriptocentric. He was following he was following uh, the teleprompter, right? That's right. Um, That's right. When I say orthodox, he's also very mannered and measured, right? Mm -hmm. Mannered and measured in the way he delivers his speech and in the way he carries himself. On stage, right? I, I think um, it's worth, yeah. I, I think it's worth noting that. Uh, uh, well, actually, I was old enough <laughs> to have heard Ferdinand Marcos, the father, actually mm -hmm. uh, speak. No? Uh, and you know, these were stem winders. Now, I mean, uh, my point is that uh, his old man actually was also sometimes in the epic mode. Uh, uh -huh. You know, would speak for two hours. Uh, this was this was the era when uh, you know uh, leaders like Marcos or Fidel Castro uh, mm -hmm. uh, would would speak for hours on end and 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 the length of their speeches uh, were like a measure of their machismo. <laughs> uh, right, right. So, so I, it of course it's very much Rodrigo Duterte who was actually from that same era, um, but uh, also Ferdinand Marcos Senior. Right, but I don't think John that Marcos Jr. inherited, no, inherited that spontaneity of of the father. This one no. really has to stick to his script, because the spontaneity or the any spur of the moment um, utterance will somehow unravel something about the son. <laughs> that's that's my take. That's, that's my take. Yes, I and I agree with that. Thank you. One last uh, term for definition, uh, Prof. OJ. Some, sometimes you, I think, a couple of times you use the word virtuoso. Uh, yeah. What does that mean in terms of speech analysis? Yeah, I mean, in again, in in rhetoric and performance studies, virtuosity really refers to a degree of mastery. Mm -hmm. It's a degree of mastery that you are not an amateur that you have a specialization in a way and that you have subjected yourself to a series of practice and rehearsal, right? So mm -hmm. I see in Marcus Jr. this conscious attempt to be virtuosic in his speech, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of being errant and illiberal in his speech, he, 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 he kind of held it together stayed as constrained and conforming to communi communicative protocols as possible. Again, there are many reasons mm -hmm. behind such behavior, right? There are many reasons. Right. You, can call this, um, you can call this propaganda at one end of the pole, but you can also say that it is a sign of um, muted inefficiency, diba? or or um, ano ba? Lack of brilliance. No, he really okay. has to rehearse. He really has to rehearse and be as um, prepared as possible. Otherwise, otherwise, it he would unravel a thing or two about himself. Do you think that um, ordinary citizens will intuit that when they look at him? Um, when they listen to him? Well, 
I, I think Marcos Jr. is somehow cultivating this veneer of authority and aspiration, right? Mm -hmm. Being English speaking and be and sounding fluent, um, a speaker, sometimes uh, invoking the poetic register or the idiomatic register. But there's in, in a country where English is primal and central, mm -hmm. there's that certain kind of aspirational quality, right, to, to Marcus Jr. I think we need to be aware of the discursive, right? formation of that veneer right that it is constructed it is not inherent to marcos jr that there are rhetorical strategies and embodied acts mm -hmm. behind right this veneer of authority and aspiration and one strategy is really speaking in english sounding mm -hmm. fluent um invoking this poetic register Right, um, resorting to mythical statements, among other things, no, among other things. Mm -hmm. So we, we really need to be aware of these things so as not to fall into the trap of mysticism, if I may say. Mm -hmm. Now, all of all of these are all of these are spun. All of these are spun. Right? That there is nothing natural about it. And as such, if it is constructed, then we can deconstruct it and do, we can reconstruct it. Do you think uh, he will grow uh, um, it, it, during his term? Uh, he will grow uh, more sp spontaneous. Uh, he, he, will, he will develop as a uh, much more confident uh, public speaker uh, with more extemporaneous uh, Asides, I think. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure about that, but I'm more interested in the kinds of strategies that he will learn to deploy mm -hmm. in the coming years, right? At the moment, what we are seeing is a very calculated speaker, right? All right. Wh whether this calculation will last or not, whether we he will relax a bit and and um, open himself up to, say, spontaneous moments. That's something that I am interested in, in seeing. Let's go back to the role of the State of the Nation address. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that the uh, president gave uh, his uh, legislative agenda, uh, which is, mm -hmm. I think, uh, one half of the uh, purpose of a State of the Nation address. The other half, uh, is actually to give a situation. You know, this is the state of the nation as, as it is right now. I don't know if you noticed, but in this particular first sauna, he spent a very short paragraph describing today. He just said that you know that we have uh, there are many problems. Some of them are uh, of, of forces beyond our control, and some of them are mm -hmm. of our own making. And that was it. Uh, interspersed uh, throughout the presentation of his ideas, his plans, and so on, you would get some idea that, uh, you know, there, there are problems with transportation, with uh, rice prices, and so on. But there was no specific section really just to describe uh, the, the, the real state of the nation. Um, I guess this is part of the entire calculation, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I think obliqueness is a strategy mm -hmm. right not hitting things head on but only um addressing them subtly is a strategy for one this president is trying to be as diplomatic as possible and benevolent mm -hmm. as possible mm -hmm. not only to his predecessor but also in relation to the image that he wants to cultivate as a leader Mm -hmm. In his inaugural speech, he talked about pagkakaisa, pagkakaisa, pagkakaisa. And we all know that how, how feeble right, that particular um, theme could get mm -hmm. once uh, the president starts dwelling on 
the problems or the national condition mm -hmm. of the Philippines, diba? Because, I mean, dwelling on national the, the national condition or the aspects of our overall national condition would would um, raise questions. So what 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 did the predecessor do? Right? All or right. how come we are in this state? So I think he's very careful in that sense. He's very careful in that sense. Uh, let, let, let's talk about the substance of uh, the state of the nation uh, address. Um, can an approach defined by uh, rhetoric and performance um, help us uh, understand uh, the substantive part of a particular speech? So, for instance, uh, I note that except for the phrase quantum computing and mm -hmm. possibly the phrase modular nuclear power plants, everything else in that speech had been said already by previous presidents. In other words, lack of originality. How, how, mm -hmm. how should we approach this lack of originality from your perspective? Mm. I think Marcus Jr. is... Hmm. I, I'm not so sure if Marcus Jr. lacks originality, but mm -hmm. what I am sure is that he tries to present himself as a different kind of leader. He's almost trying to sound like he belongs to a new breed of Filipino leaders, the way he mm -hmm. refers to, 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 um, an infra to, to infrastructure, mm -hmm. to, 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 to digital connectivity, right? To nuclear power plants, etc. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. he's he's trying to show himself as this um, forward-looking, right, advanced, uh, progressive-minded leader, right? Very technocratic in register. He, he even talked about going full speed ahead, mm -hmm. right? A lot of a lot of references to efficiency, to seamlessness, right? To addressing social inequality via digital connectivity, no matter how ludicrous that statement is, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I sense that there's a lot of a lot of references to the new and the efficient, right? To building better and more, right? To to um, to connecting the islands, right? To the connecting to connecting the islands. So mm -hmm. I, I I think he's trying to. While he's trying on the one hand to sound like his father and tap into what his father started, such as, say, the specialty hospitals. He talked about the specialty hospitals. Yeah, the he's also trying... Part. Right, exactly. He right? talked about the heart center, kidney center, among other mm -hmm. things. He's also trying to bank on technology, mm -hmm. right, to add um, a new flavor to that. Right, so I, I was just struck by the you know I I I've, I've listened to many of these sonas and uh, building airports you know that's been around since at the very least Gloria Arroyo uh, uh, building uh, on tourism as a, a principal industry that's been around since forever right I mean mm -hmm. uh, again ex with exception of that phrase quantum computing and maybe modular nuclear power plants mm -hmm. uh, everything yeah. else had been said. Um, but um, I wonder if I can uh, turn the, the, the question around. Um, was there anything that you expected him to do or say, which he did not, in fact, uh, do or say? Well, as many, um, as many scholars and pundits have already said, I was expecting a more comprehensive um a more comprehensive plan about corruption, mm -hmm. about human rights, um, about uh, about uh, addressing the opposition, right? Mm -hmm. Dealing with dealing with um, left leaning, right? Left leaning um, parties. So I was I was waiting for that, and how he would situate that within this. Um, larger theme of unity 
or progress and development, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, it's it might be predictable by now. Not, I mean, it might be predictable that he would not address these things. But I mean, as as a as a listener, as a citizen, I was hoping a bit against hope, right, mm -hmm. that he would at least allude to these issues, but he did not. Yeah. Um, for my part, I, I was surprised that he mentioned his father uh, only once and very yeah. obliquely, as you said, no? Yeah. Obliqueness is the strategy. Uh, right. Saying, uh, hoping to have better relations with Saudi Arabia. Uh, right. Like it was sa panahon ng ama ko at nung hari nila, no? Uh, yeah. Beyond that, I, I actually expected him to do some more Marcus Smith making, but uh, again, maybe right. is is the is the strategy. Um, yeah, it 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 seems like uh, whether he's playing a role or this is really him, this is his character. He is uh, no drama, bong bong Marcos, right? Mm -hmm. the, the exact opposite of our very. Dramatic uh, Rodrigo Duterte. Right. Uh, do you do you share that view? I mean, uh, or I, I I think John the drama has changed its register, right? The drama yeah. now is not bluster. The drama now is about this highly eloquent, proficient, um, uh, intelligent drama. You know? mm -hmm. And I, I I sense this. I sense this drama. In the phrases that he he used mm -hmm. in the past two speeches, no, mm -hmm. I, I thought that the the ending to the sauna was very dramatic. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. He said, mm -hmm. "We will endure. Let our Filipino spirit remain undimmed. Mm -hmm. I know this in my mind. I know it in my heart. I know mm -hmm. it in my very soul. Right. The state mm -hmm. of the nation is sound. Yeah. To me, that was very dramatic and." Mm -hmm. Maybe not the best way to end the sauna, mm -hmm. right? Because it 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 sounded um, over the top. It sounded very emotional, sentimental. But it is this sentimentality or sentimentalism that I think um, contributes to the enchantment you know, of 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 the Marcoses in general. This is the register. This is the register that his mom used. Whenever she referred to the arts, for example, mm -hmm. this mythical register was yeah. what Imelda Marcos, like you say, when she inaugurated the cultural center of the Philippines. That's right. That's right. right? Like heart, mm -hmm. mind, soul. Right. Mm -hmm. So these are abstractions. These are myth mythicisms that we we really need to to. Um, be more conscious and cautious of. And I'm, I'm sure we're going to hear more of these buzzwords right, in, uh, yeah. in the coming years. Maybe we can talk about uh, one more member of the Marcos family. Uh, uh, whether or not you agree with the uh, assumption that President Marcos is playing a role, he's the no drama guy. As you said, maybe the drama now is lack of uh, no bluster and so on. Um, the public speeches and performances of uh, his sister, Aimee Marcos, mm -hmm. very different from no drama, bong bong, mm -hmm. right? Uh, she's the one who said, I hope that he will use his sauna to get really mad. For the first time, let him get mad, name the you know heads of criminal syndicates and, and so on and so forth. She's also the person who, who said, um, we don't really mind, you know, going, living back in the palace, you know. We've been there, essentially been there, done that, right? Very different from her. Whether or not she's playing a role, uh, the difference is marked. My question is, can, can you kindly uh, analyze her public speech uh, speeches too? Yeah, I mean, Ivy Marcos is a different beast altogether. Mm -hmm. And she's a very interesting figure not only a speaker but a performer right mm -hmm. she performs a lot in tiktok on youtube mm -hmm. um in her interviews even in her film uh film productions no i mean during the campaign we saw her len len videos and how vile they were right and now we're seeing how she's trying to celebrify herself 
That's right. right? To celebrify mm-hmm. herself by appearing in all of these interviews and collaborating with all of these artists, etc. I think she is trying to be the foil. She is trying to be the foil to Bongbong Bong Marcos. Mm-hmm. And maybe trying to share the energies, the populist energies, and the popular personality of Rodrigo Duterte, right? So she is the midway. She is the midway between a Duterte and a Marcos Jr. Either way, you are still securing, Mm -hmm. right, two different bases, right? So I think she's someone we should be very careful of. And should really, should really be um, very vigilant of, because I'm sure this is a clever, clever take on how to do politics in in this um, post-colonial nation where showbiz <laughs> and politics, right, mm-hmm. intertwine. They intertwine, and um, the voting public is also a viewing public. The voting public is also a viewing public and they want to be entertained. Whether it's politics or showbiz, that's entertainment for the Filipino voting public. So I'm looking at I mean not only as a speaker, but as a performer. As a performer. A performer that does many things that her brother cannot simply do. You know we're running long, but uh, can I ask one more question? Um, Go for it. You you noted the different the, the use of uh, English and Filipino during the sauna, uh, but uh, it was it was actually very clear, uh, and I was glad that you noted this uh, at the time. Um, his first use, his first extended use of Filipino was when he spoke of agriculture and so mm-hmm. on. And, and you said, "Wow, language as a class indicator." Right. Can you explain this? Right. I mean, John, that actually drew a lot of flack from um, the supporters of Marcus Jr. and even Duterte. When I say that his language use may be considered a marker of our social divide in the Philippines, Mm -hmm. I'm referring to a strategic way Right, a strategic way of knowing your audience, and in a way situating that audience depending on how you talk to them. Mm-hmm. Why, for example, can we not talk to even our investors here in the language that they, to begin with, should know Filipino because they're working with Filipinos? Why must our language, when talking to say farmers, to migrant workers, um, just be in Filipino? Why, why can't it be, I mean, why, why, why segregate? Why segregate? Why can't it just be like, we, we know of a president who talked in Filipino from start to end, right? Whether he talked about the economy, whether he talked about education, migration, agriculture, he talked in Filipino, mm-hmm. right? But here, we, 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 we saw very clearly at which points the president used Filipino and at which points he used English. So to me, that shift in linguistic register mm-hmm. was also telling not only about how the president looked at his audience, but also how we as a society stereotype particular publics right so i'll leave it at that thank you you know very much to uh, to think about i think we should uh, revisit this uh, subject uh, in the near future um but we've run out of time it's time to call it a day to professor oscar oj serkinia jr dr serkinia of the university of the philippines thank you for your time your insights and your work defining and defending the public square Thank you so much, John. I hope to see you. That's it for us tonight. The next step for engaged citizens is always to take more acti- to take a more active part in rebuilding our democracy. See you in the public square.
This is John Neri. Thank you and good night. Thank you.